hope you'll uh, bear with us as uh, this is the first time we've used this space that we have for this kind of an event. So there may be a few hiccups as we move along. Uh, but again, just bear with us. We have been doing a little series uh, <clears throat> the la in this, the fall this year of uh, something we call the Canadian Creative Canadian Speaking Series. And, um, and, and tonight is one of those events, and I'm very, very happy to say that I'm able to do it with the Academy and with the Diwan. And you all know Diwan, and uh, you know his events are wonderful, and that's why you're here tonight, because you know his events are wonderful. Uh, and I, I can't thank you enough, Diwan, for, uh, for joining us in this little enterprise tonight. But I do want to, and I'm not going to give you a long introduction to Surinder. Uh First, I'll tell you, that when we arrived here a year and a half ago, it was fairly clear that people either didn't know about the consulate or only thought the consulate was about visas. And while we do visas here, we also do a lot of other stuff. And so my staff and I, we undertook to start changing what people think about us Canadians and about our consulate in Chandigarh. And part of it has been a series of events like this one. Uh, it was fairly easy to see from when we got here, that there's a strong connection between Punjab and Canada. It's, it, there's so many uh, Canadians that are, are back here, so many Punjabis that are in Canada. But there, there was the, the, the creative angle that I was sort of searching for uh, as a way to, to explore another part of our relationship. And so we've been doing that through film, and uh, now, very thankfully, we're going to do it this evening by introducing you to uh, a Canadian artist. Um, when we left uh, Canada to come here, we told all our friends, as we always do, come and visit us, come, come, come visit us in Cambodia, come visit us in China, come visit us wherever we are. And of course we said that when we left Canada a year and a half ago. And um, one of the friends we said that to uh, is in Toronto and is a dear friend of, of Surinda Daliwals. And that's how the connection um, sort of happened with us because she was coming out and of course they told us she was coming out and so we got together. And uh, on her first visit, we didn't have quite enough time to put together an event like this. We did have time for her to meet Divan, and uh, that sort of started the idea that we might be able to realize this. And so we finally have. Now here's the introduction. Surinder was born here. In fact, she was born about 28 kilometers from here. Well, at least she was a child 28 kilometers from here. Uh, from Jalandar, sorry. It's about 109 kilometers from here. But then she went on to the UK, where she studied fine arts. And then she went on to Canada, where she continued to study fine arts. Um, the distance from here to Toronto is about 12,000 kilometers. So it's a little further than from here to Jalandar. But I found in looking at, at the, the, her material and at her film that we're going to see this evening, that there's interesting lines drawn through all those places, both here, from here to the UK, from here to the UK to Canada, and to other places. And certainly other levels of, um, for me, <clears throat> lots of interesting emotional things, whether it's in her, or the visual art that she does, or in the, the, the video that you're gonna see. She has, she's been showing things in the UK and in Canada. There's a, she had a showing here in Delhi recently with some others. There's an exhibit going on right now in Canada that's uh, honoring the 100th anniversary of the, the Gudwada in Abbotsford. So in her, her, she's showing as part of that. Um, all I can say is I, she's a wonderful artist, but for me, more importantly, she's become a good friend. And an excellent house guest, I can tell you, is one of the best house guests we've ever had. <laughs> and, and with that, I think I want to just pass it over to her and to let her walk you through uh, what she does and to, uh, to sort of share that with you. So thank you very much for coming. And ladies and gentlemen, Sarinda Dalawa. We're going to start uh, the evening um, by showing a short film. It's about 12 minutes long. It's my first film. Um, it took me a long time to make. I started it in 2007, and uh, it finally got finished at the end of 2010, mostly because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and after that, uh, I'll show you some images of my work. And uh, I'll try to, the film is 12 minutes, and I'll try not to talk for longer than 40 minutes. Um, and I have a watch, so. Oranges and lemons, say 
the bells of St. Thomas, you owe me five farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey? When I grow rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. Pancakes and fritters, say the bells of St. Peter's. Just chicks and an apple, say the bells of Whitechapel. Old Father Baldpate, say the slow bells of Aldgate. Pokers and tongs, say the bells of St. John's. Kettles and pans, say the bells of St. Lavender's blue, diddle diddle, lavender's green. When I am king, diddle diddle, you shall be queen. Call up your men, diddle diddle, set them to work. Some to the plow, diddle diddle, some to the cart. Some to make hay, diddle diddle, some to cut corn. While you and Some people regard him simply as a racist, others as honestly reflecting the views of his constituents. Mr. Enoch Powell, likening the race relations bill to a match thrown onto gunpowder, says that immigration should be virtually stopped. The minister responsible to race relations has called Mr. Powell's speech extremely valid. Powell's speech was splashed across the Sunday papers, it's and, office and we will trace the source of Powell's river's blood oh, to his wartime service in India and to his burning ambitions in Viceroy of India, following the footsteps of the illustrious Victorian Senate Warriors who held that office. It is very much looking forward to a visit. But the bringing temperatures up to the events is normal for a time, but then cold northerly winds returning, and once again there will be further snow showers the northern coasts and hills, especially later in the week. Parts of the coast of northeast England. There was a lot of sunshine throughout the first of the British Isles, 10 hours worth of Cardiff in South Wales. But still some hail and snow showers, and again, most of these coming into northern Scotland. But for most of the British Isles, best temperatures were around 5 or 6 degrees, which is the degree on the island. Bobby Shafto's gone to sea Silver buckles on his knee You'll come back and marry me Pretty Bobby Shafto Bobby Shafto's fat and fair Combing down his yellow yellow hair he's my love forevermore pretty bobby shaft oh where have you been billy boy billy boy oh where have you been charming billy Oh, where have you been, Billy Boy, Billy Boy? Oh, where have you been, Charming Billy? 
I have been to seek a wife. She's the joy of my life, but she's a young girl and cannot leave her mother. I have been to seek a wife. She's the joy of my life, but she's a young girl and cannot leave her mother. Can she bake a cherry pie, Billy boy, Billy boy? Can she bake a cherry pie, charming Billy? She can bake a cherry pie in the twinkling of an eye, but she young girl and cannot leave her mother. Cannot leave her mother. The big ship sails in the alley alley o, the alley alley o, the alley alley o. The big ship sails in the alley alley o on the last day of September. The captain said it will never never do, never never do, never never do. The captain said it will never never do on the last day of September. The big ship sank to the bottom of the sea, the bottom of the sea, the bottom of the sea. The big ship sank to the bottom of the sea on the last day of September. We all dip our hands. Into the, into the deep blue sea, into the deep blue sea, into the deep blue sea. We all dip our hands into the deep blue sea on the last day of September. The oil and the pussy cat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money, wrapped up in the five pound note. They all looked up to the stars above and sang to a small guitar. Oh lovely pussy, oh pussy my love, what a beautiful pussy you are, you are, you are. What a beautiful pussy you are. Pussy said to the owl, you elegant fowl, how charmingly sweet you sing. Oh let us be married, too long we have tarried, but what shall we do for a ring? They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there in a wood a piggy wing stood with a ring at the end of his nose. His nose, his nose, with a ring at the end of his nose. The pig, are you willing to sell one shilling? Your ring, said the piggy, I will. So they took it a wee and were married next day by the turkey who lives on the hill. They dined on mints and slices of quince, which they ate with a runcible spoon. And hand in hand, on the edge of the sand, they danced by the light of the moon. The moon, the moon. They danced by the light of the moon. I had a little nut tree, nothing would it bear, but a silver nutmeg and a golden pear. The king of Spain's daughter, she came to visit me, and all for the sake of my little nut tree. Bobby Shaft was gone to sea. Silver buckles on his knee. He'll come, He'll come back and marry me. To marry me. Pretty Bobby Pretty Shafto. Bobby Shafto. Bobby Shafto was fat and fit and fair. Combing down. Combing down his yellow hair. He's my. 
Bobby Shaft has gone to see Silver Bubbles on his knees. He'll come back and marry. He'll come back and marry Bobby Shaft. Pretty Bobby Shaft. दस तेरी की रह गई नी जद जुड़ के जनानी रह गई साडे कुड़े तू चाहती तें पर जाइए नी अस छड़े जहानों जाइए मंदड़े हाल कुड़े Lavender's blue, diddle diddle, lavender's green. When I am king, diddle diddle, you shall be queen. Call up your men, diddle diddle, set them to work. Some to the plow, diddle diddle, some to the cart. Some to make hay, diddle diddle, some to cut corn. While you and I, diddle diddle, keep ourselves warm. Um, one of the things that happened to me when I was growing up uh, in London, in Southall, which is a borough on the western edge of London, and I suppose it's considered the capital of Punjabi Britain. Um, this was in the mid-50s, and one of the things I quickly realized was that um, growing up in that community, whenever I wanted to do something that my mother didn't want me to do, she would say, we don't want to do that. And I learnt as a small child that this we was not me, and it wasn't her, but it was the Sikh community. Um, and she was, she was illiterate, and she would often say to me, uh, you have to do this. And going to school in England, I was learning how how to be rational and I wanted from this illiterate mother a rational reason for everything that she asked me to do and she was unable to provide that so um, once I started to make art I began to revisit those instances of childhood where I was very perplexed um, and I made work about those things to try and sort of um, unravel it and explain it uh, really to myself so one of the things that she would do when I was young, she would say, uh, you have to call this person this, and you have to call this person that. And I would say, but why? And she was not able to tell me. So this piece is called um, uh, Punjabi Sheets Family Tree. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-30s that I started to understand why she wanted me to call someone Masi and someone Bua. Um, so um, <clears throat> I went to my family and I asked uh, all about the relationships and I think that for a Western audience, this is really about the difference between um, Indian values and Western values where here we really value the family. So when you introduce somebody to someone using that uh, kinship term, you know exactly how you're related, whether it's by blood, by marriage, or if it's on the paternal or the um, maternal side. 
And I was quite amazed to know that there was even a relationship, there was a word for the relationship between my brother's wife and my sister's husband. Because in uh, English, that's very confusing. We have in-law, and it could mean anything. So um, this piece is, is about that. It's on slate. And the person who engraved this is the person who engraves tombstones. And I think he did a quite nice job, uh, given that he was just used to saying, you know, uh, the name of somebody who died and, and the years that they lived. The, um, the bowls on the side, often people think they're very significant, but in fact they're just uh, coconut shells filled with color, and it's more of an aesthetic um, reason rather than uh, something that has deep meaning. Um, one of the th problems for me as an artist is I make different kinds of work and I make installations and I make these very large scale uh, watercolor paintings and they do look like they're made by different people but in fact often um, one installation um, gives birth to a painting, or a painting gives birth to an installation. This is a piece that um, I made after a trip to India in the 90s, and I photographed a lot of billboards. Uh, so I often found uh, the text on the billboards quite amusing. So, um, for example, there's one, I think it has fridges, and it says, um, Uh, or it says, you know, they have um, buy fridges, not guns, or uh, something like that. And often these pieces, um, they just kind of grow organically. Like I don't know what's going to be in them. I usually start with one thing. And then I sometimes just add my favorite stuff. So uh, you can see that there's um, a repainting of an image from the book Little Black Sambo that was banned in Britain. <coughs> Uh, for its racist overtones, and that's the uh, tiger with the umbrella. Um, and <clears throat> I took that slide of uh, the goddess in a market in Delhi, and of course I don't read Hindi, so when I projected it to paint it, I did it backwards. Um, but rather than change it, I decided I would just paint the English sign backwards too, so that, you know, nobody could complain. Um, there's a, a, an image which is of a chrysanthemum, and I took that image in a garden show in Delhi. So there's a close-up of it. Thank you. Um, and that same image I used in this piece, which is an installation. So that's how, the, how there's a connection between the uh, paintings and the installations. Um, so I wanted to make a print of uh, some of the images I'd taken in that garden show and uh, they were uh, put onto plates, zinc plates that were to be etched. Um, and then eventually we couldn't uh, print them because the paper I wanted to use was, was too thick. But I decided that the plates themselves were really beautiful and so we just made 12 plates and uh, they sit in the corner of, a, of the gallery and there's a film that's projected onto them. And the film is just mostly abstract, it's yellow, looks like rain. So those are the kind of connections that um, I make in my work. Um, I made this piece <clears throat> in response to um, uh, comments that my work was decorative. And that's a very uh, derogatory term that they use for uh, artists, so it means kind of meaningless, too pretty. So I decided, okay, if you think that was decorative, I'll show you what decorative really is. So I went overboard, and, and it was quite interesting that this piece got written about as deconstructing decoration. Um, <laughs> And it was a kind of self-portrait in a way. It had people who really influenced me. There's an image of my mother uh, in the, on the top row, Frida Kahlo, uh, whose work I loved. Um, and lots of images of, of things that I've made work about, mangoes, bananas, tulips, zebras. 
And I also wrote a story. So um, there's two typewritten sheets that are collaged onto this piece. And the first story was one that my mother would tell me. Um, and she told me that um, when I was a baby in the Punjab, I got very sick. And um, she and my aunt took me to lots of doctors. Nobody could uh, figure out what was wrong. They thought I was going to die. And then a tinker came to their village, and uh, they'd said to him, you know, our pots don't need mending, but our baby is dying. And he said, take a freshly laid egg and put it in the crossroads, and the first thing that smushes it, the baby will get better. So after making this piece, I started to just make eggs. Uh, and so um, this, so that very decorative piece actually gave birth to this installation. And I've installed it a number of times. Uh, in fact, it's uh, up right now uh, in a gallery in Victoria in a three-person show, and I did bring the catalog of that, which you can have a look at later. Um, <clears throat> with my installation work, um, usually uh, I make it for the site. So every time this piece has been installed, I've gone to the gallery ahead of time and decided where it should go and how high it should be and how wide it should be. Um, so there's always, it's, I always use a corner and there's always a shelf that's wide at one end and it goes around the corner and um, the text is usually written in uh, oil stick. So the next few slides are just different uh, um, versions of the installation in different places. And I don't know what's going to happen when I'm no longer around to do the writing because uh, um, I guess I'll have to find <clears throat> some way of, um, of uh, recreating it. It's very interesting. That piece actually belongs to an institution but all they have are the eggs, because every single time it's installed, it has to have the walls painted and the shelf has to be built for um, the site. Um, my mother would come back to India you know, quite often when I was a child and I refused to come with her. And I think it was because of my experience growing up in, in Southall and feeling that the community sort of disapproved of, of, um, of girls. Uh, girls who didn't conform to uh, the way that they would have if they had stayed in the Punjab. So it took me a long time before I actually returned to this village. Um, and at that point I thought maybe I was too old for them to tell me off about, you know, not combing my hair properly or... Uh, and it was a very interesting experience because it felt like times hadn't changed from the um, time that my mother left to now. <clears throat> so this, um, this slide was taken in um, 2002, and you can see that the women are um, you know, doing communal cooking. And I felt a little bit like I was stepping back 50 years and stepping back into the life that, that my mother would have lived. Uh, and it's quite funny, you know, when I do go there now, the first question they ask me is, how many children do I have? And, and I don't have any. And then the second question is, well, uh, are you married? And then that surprises them because I'm not. But <clears throat> it even surprises them that I don't have uh, pierced ears. They're sort of aghast at that. Uh, but it's been quite enjoyable. And I think at some level, um, the women in that village do sort of uh, admire maybe um, the route I've taken. So um, here is a, a, a picture I took in the village, and um, I'm going to show you a picture that I took in 1978. So uh, this was the first time I visited India, and I actually did not go to the Punjab. I went straight to uh, other parts of India, and I had just finished art school. Uh, I did um, sculpture. I graduated in sculpture, and those were the years of minimalism in sculpture. So when I saw these uh, cow dung patties um, stacked like this, it reminded me of um, minimalist sculpture. And I kept thinking, one day I want to make something that's based on these. 
And it took me a long time. It took me about 18 years to figure out, you know, how I would like to do it. So this is the first piece. Um, it's made of paper pulp and straw. And I did a number of um, pieces uh, based on this idea of the cow dung patty. And again, uh, these installations are always made to suit the site. So in this case, this was in Vancouver, and there's a, um, a low uh, shelf built, and part of the wall is painted. And then these red patties are placed on the shelf. And here's another image um, of the piece where uh, the whole room is painted black, and there's a shelf that's about 30 inches high and the patties are on that. So, um, you know, I like this body of work because if somebody asked me to show in a closet, I could probably um, organize that. Um, so I think that uh, what was really interesting for me in, um, in doing this was that I began to use the gallery walls painted as integral parts of the piece. Uh, and there's usually pigment as well that's uh, placed underneath the, the patties or the bricks. And a lot of my work has a kind of um, uh, an inspiration that, you know, it's not easy to get just from the work. You either have to have me there explaining it or talking about it. And this piece, which has 800 patties, it's, and I'm very low tech, it was made with, um, a tea strainer. Uh, so the wall is painted red um, and the 800 patties are stuck onto the wall with just blue tack. And the story behind this piece is another tale that my mother used to tell me and uh, it really frightened me but uh, sometimes children like to be frightened and they say tell me that story again. So she told me that um, one of the ways that you used to make cow dung patties was, uh, you know, make them with your hands and then throw them at the wall where they would stick. The sun would bake them dry and then they would be prized off and then stacked in the minimalist sculptural mounds. Um, and she said that a woman in her village was making these patties and the wall fell down on top of her and she died. And so they took her inside the house and uh, they cried all night and in the morning, this woman's leg moved and she came back to life. And she had the same kind of story to tell that everyone who says they died tells. And that's that she was, you know, dragged through a tunnel and uh, she came out on the other side and it was lovely. Uh, but there somebody said to her, it's not your time, you have to go back, you know. Uh, we've brought you t four years early, too early. So according to my mother, four years to the day, the woman collapsed at a railway station and died. So as a child, it was very fascinating for me to kind of think about this, this idea of life after death and death. Um, so a lot of my work echoes, um, you know, the installations echo uh, the two-dimensional pieces. This is a, a photograph, and it's a photograph of, of sources that I used to mix watercolor paint on. Um, originally it was shown as part of an installation and now it's a standalone piece. So um, for my mother, I think I was a very easy child, uh, apart from the fact of not doing what she said uh, <laughs> in terms of calling people what they should be called. But I never asked for toys. I used to play with bits of paper and make up stories, and uh, I used to play with pencils. And I would pretend that, um, you know, the pencils were people, and if the pencil was blunt, uh, it meant that this pencil was sick and it had to go to the hospital, which was a pencil sharpener. Um, and so I just amused myself. And becoming an artist, I often worked with uh, colored pencils. So uh, this piece is called Southall. So it's about growing up in Southall and it's called Southall Child Play. It's every single pencil I own. 
It's 35 feet long and about three feet high. And there's a couple of details. Uh, so this is about almost life size, a little bit bigger, uh, and it's uh, so the resolution is is very good. And uh, when I was going off to sharpen these pencils um, in order to get them ready for this piece, I fell, and I didn't realize, but I broke my hand. And uh, then I spent the afternoon with a broken hand, not knowing, but sharpening 400 pencils. Thank you. Um, this is also from the Southall series, and it's called When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a Namer of Paint Colors. So another aspect of my practice has been uh, the use of text. Uh, and I had great fun with this piece because I just imagined that I did have a job in a paint factory and uh, it was my job to, to name the colors. I don't know if you, if in India you have paint chips with names of colors, but you know, it's almost like writing poetry. So there's a, there's a close up of the piece. And you know, I'm not very logical. You know, people will say, well, how can you, how can you call, um, you know, pinks and, and purples Belfast Midnight? But I think that one of the pleasures of being an artist is to be purely whimsical. Um, this piece is also, also comes from an aspect of childhood. Um, you know, my, my Mother didn't approve of me reading, but she never stopped me buying newspapers. So even as a small uh, girl, I, I would buy newspapers. And one of the things that fascinated me was in the back where they uh, talked about people who had got married. You know, they would say that uh, Mr. So-and-so from this sector two is marrying somebody from sector seven. And as a child, I, I thought you were only supposed to marry one. There was only one person in the entire world that you were supposed to marry. And I couldn't understand how it was possible that that person lived around the corner from you. I thought, logically, they had to live in Australia or China. Um, and in the, in the 90s, uh, I used to get the New York Sunday Times and the society pages uh, always had these pictures of women who were announcing their engagements. Um, so I started to cut out um, all of these uh, little images of, of the brides. And I had just done some work on arranged marriages in a South Asian context. And when you would read what the, the, the accompanying text to these photos, it would often say things like Miss So-and-so, the granddaughter of the president of the Chase Manhattan Bank, is going to marry Mr. So-and-so, the grandson of the president of the other bank. And so I realized that in, uh, in this particular society, uh, there was a kind of arranged marriage. So um, again, this piece is very large. There are 640 photographs. And uh, the way it was produced was I uh, took those little pictures I cut out of the newspaper, I reshot them on black and white film, and then I printed the black and white negatives on color paper, but with only the red turned up. And every single one of the 640 women in this piece is wearing pearls. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it made me think about National Geographic and when they, um, you know, have uh, articles on, on tribes in Africa with particular initiation rites. I thought, you know, here's a tribe that lives in the northeastern part of the states and they have this initiation that when they get engaged, they have to have their picture in the New York Sunday Times and they have to wear pearls. <laughs> And uh, when I was making this piece, I, was, uh, I made it in Banff, um, which is an artist center. And the woman in the studio next to me came from a rich family. 
And she looked at these pictures and she pointed out to me, she'd, she'd point at every picture and she'd say, see those pearls, they're fake. They're only worth $1,200. See those pearls, they're real. Um, so, you know, there's always coding that outsiders don't understand. So someone like me could never read the value of the pearls, but she could. And there's a little uh, telephone, red telephone in this piece, that when you pick it up, it has a song on it, which is a, um, a song from about 1963 called Hey Hey Paula. And it's a kind of schmaltzy love song about, you know, true love and there only being one person that you should, uh, you know, want to be with. This is a more recent piece. Uh, it's called The Green Fairy Storybook. And again, it uh, comes from um, my relationship with my mother. Uh, she thought that I read too much. So I, I would go to the public library, you know, when I was seven or eight, and I would get stacks and stacks and stacks of books. And I'd bring them home, and I'd just devour them. And she would just shout at me the whole time, because she said, you know, you read too much, it means you're not going to do well in school. Um, so this piece is kind of about learning to read, and it's about um, my early love of color. Uh, the paper, uh, I actually, I was in Pondicherry, and I purchased the paper from um, the uh, paper-making facility there, which is now, which is now closed. Um, and the table was made specifically for the piece, uh, but it looks like it's 50 years old. So you can see a little bit, the text, it reads, um, you read it horizontally across the spines of the books. Um, it's a second book work I've made. Uh, this was the first. So these books are quite large. They're about 16 inches by 20 inches uh, by about 5 inches. And it, um, it's called The Book of Yellow. And it comes from a body of work called the Akashic Library. And the Akashic Library is um, it's a metaphysical space. The Akashic Library is supposed to be where every single thing in the entire history of the universe is recorded from every single perspective. And it came about from the research I did into life after death. Uh, I was having a lot of trouble, you know, I'm not religious. And uh, there were a couple of very brutal murders of children in Toronto. And I found it um, very hard to understand why you know, if people believed in God, where was God when, you know, he was really needed? Um, so, in doing the re research, I came across this idea of the Akashic Library. And so the Book of Yellow is so, supposed to re represent volumes in the Akashic Library that tell you every single thing that you need to know about yellow. And again, you know, it's a, uh, an installation piece, and uh, every single time I've shown it, uh, it has to be shown in a different format depending on where the, uh, where the gallery is and what kind of things they have. So in this case, this was in England, and it was in a gallery that's attached to a university, and there was a professor, a retired professor, who left all of his slides, uh, his, his, the drawers for his art history slides, in, in that um, space. So we used that, we, we built a plinth and uh, then put the books on top of um, the slide cases. Uh, this is in Wales, uh, where we painted the corner of the room and built circular shelves. And this is in Kingston. Uh, and that, um, desk belonged to the first governor general of uh, Canada, who was an author, John Buchan, who wrote The 39 Steps. Uh, so I was, very, I was very delighted that we could use his desk. And uh, this is an image of the same piece in Winnipeg. And Winnipeg is a city in the prairies in Canada. And it's a city that didn't have much money. 
in uh, you know the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. So they never pulled down all of the wonderful turn of the century buildings, big um, um, six-story buildings. In Toronto, they were all pulled down because Toronto has money. But um, ironically, uh, Winnipeg does very well as a film location because it still has those buildings and it can uh, it can be used as um, uh, the idea of Chicago or New, Ye New York at the turn of the century. So we were, we were able to rent all this furniture from um, people in Winnipeg who supply the film industry. Um, a friend of mine uh, has this porch and uh, she invites artists to uh, make things for the porch. Uh, so she asked me, so this is the piece that I did. And it's called, um, called the Wind Virago. So little curtains were made for each of these panes. And um, there's been a history of calling uh, hurricanes by female names. So on each pane, there was uh, the name of a hurricane and the year of the hurricane. So uh, it's, it's a system that's developed um, and it's been very useful because if I say the word Katrina to you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But if I said, oh, you know, the hurricane that started at 22 degrees latitude, uh, it's, it's meaningless. Um, I had the curtains made in Delhi. I was uh, there in 2002 on a, on a residency. And of course, the porch wasn't there and the windows weren't there, but um, I, I had to uh, do a study for that piece. And so I decided that I was going to make a piece called Curtains for Babel. And it was about dying languages. There are about 6,000 dying languages. Um, and when I uh, had to install this piece in Delhi, the ladder that they had there was very rickety and it was kind of like thin uh, bamboo sticks sort of tied with rope and I was too scared to get high enough to actually open the curtains on the top and so um, they remained closed. So when I did the, f um, when I did the bigger piece uh, that was Curtains for Babel, I decided that I liked the way that the curtains were closed um, and so the uh, top row had just cities or countries that I always wanted to go to. I know, and I've been here now. Uh, Dublin I've been to, Udaipur I've been to, um, Varanasi I've been to, uh, Key uh, Biscayne I've been to, and I'm going to Australia. Um, and uh, I did show this a number of times, and each time I had to make changes because um, uh, one of the languages was Welsh. So all of the languages I used were X, Y, and Z, uh, uh, and W. Uh, but I showed it in Wales, and they speak Welsh a lot. And so, um, so I couldn't act like it was a dying language there, so I had to think of something else. And so I, th I thought of um, Walloon, which is a Belgian language. And I thought, oh, there can't be anybody in this tiny town. It was a tiny town of 18,000 people. I thought, there's not going to be anyone from Belgium in this town. And can you believe it, in my hotel, there was a girl working who was from Walloon. Um, and Congo, uh, I had the um, country Congo, and I showed it at the uh, at Canada House in London. And I had to change that because um, I realized that Congo is no longer called Congo, it's called the New Democratic Republic of Congo, which was too long for my piece. But I figured, you know, maybe somebody from the Congo is going to come and, and complain. And again, this piece um, is an installation, so when I show it in different venues, it changes. So this is in Winnipeg. And that's, uh, that's again in Winnipeg, but from the outside. Um, this is a piece that... Um, I actually made three of these, and I made it after reading a very short article by Salman Rushdie 
uh, and it was about a, um, a dictionary. And the dictionary is called Hobson Jobson. Uh, I think it was um, printed in the late 19th century, and it was for, um, it may have been for the British, but it had a lot of words in it that derive from either Hindi or Sanskrit. Um, and so I made three sheets of paper, that it's, they're about four feet by four feet, and they're three-dimensional, and it was actually quite difficult to make. Um, so after I pulled three of them, the mold broke, so that was why there were only three. Um, the painting is based on temple doors, Indian temple doors. And so here you can see the three-dimensionality of the work. And um, then on the lower ledge, I uh, chose um, several words out of this um, dictionary. So there's dungarees and dam. Um, I always thought that dam was just about hell and damnation, but apparently um, it was uh, the smallest coin in the realm in India in the 19th century. So uh, I don't know how many of them were in an Anna, but uh, so when the British would go to the markets, they would say to uh, the trader, I'm not giving you a damn for that. And I think that's how that uh, phrase came into being in English. Um, so when I came here in, in uh, 2002, I started to photograph ambassador cars uh, you know, I really like them. I mean, of course, I'd never drive one because I wouldn't drive in India. Um, and a lot of my work has been generated by uh, just collecting things, um, coconuts, images of cars. Um, and I truly thought that, you know, my car just died. I had it for 20 years. Uh, it got so old, it had holes in it that it, the police actually pulled it off the streets. And uh, so when I made this piece, I, I really thought that there would be some rich woman in Canada who, you know, changed her car every year to suit her handbag, and that maybe she'd see this piece and uh, swap it for, um, for a car, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, this is a piece from 1989, and um, I guess I was still thinking about uh, my background, and what was fascinating to me was that turbans were also coded. So uh, the blue turban uh, is tied in a way that only a Sikh who has lived in Uganda would tie their turban. Um, and then uh, the orange turban is um, from a specific religious sect. Uh, so I made this piece because I wanted to think about uh, how turbans are tied by individuals, and they are very individualistic, whereas for me, the community itself seems to want to suppress individuality for the sake of familial stability. Um, I never expected to have to make, um, remake this piece, but uh, when I had a mid-survey show, uh, the curators wanted this piece. Um, so I had to redo it several times, and of course I don't know how to tie turbans. So it was always very difficult because I'd have to find people in that town to, to tie the turbans. And the next few slides are just, uh, again, um, different uh, versions of the same installation. Uh, people have described this to me as they say, oh, it looks like tulips, <laughs> like flowers. Um, originally, of course, it was on the floor uh, once in 1989, and when I redid it in the mid, in about 2005, uh, the people who came to tie the turbans for me were uh, very upset and they said, no, no, you can't have them on the floor. 
So the last few slides are just um, uh, images uh, that are, are from the film. Um, so that's an image of my mother. I think it's the first photograph, uh, or the photograph that I know of her as the youngest that she was. And it also has very decorative elements that are either taken from William Morris, um, who was a designer, a British designer, or they're from uh, decorative elements taken from Indian um, palaces or fabric. So that's, there, there's a couple more, but then um, I can take a couple of questions, if anyone has any. That's my mother um, outside of uh, the clinic that she used to hang out with her friends in England. And uh, this is the first photograph of myself um, with my mother and my grandfather. Uh, so you can see from the car how long ago it was. And I apologize for the quality of the film. You know, it's partly that it's shot on uh, HD and uh, our projector doesn't like that. So, uh, I, sorry about that. And also, with all of the girls in the school, I wanted them to have all different colors. So, you know, maybe it's not sig significant in a very deep way. Um, and one of the reasons it was so difficult to, to get the film done was um, my first editor uh, just kept saying to me, but why do you have to have so much hair combing? Why can't you just have like, you know, 20 seconds of it? And I don't work as a filmmaker. So um, most filmmakers have their, all their footage and then they go in and they pick things. And I wanted to do it the exact opposite way. I wanted to look at all of the footage and keep deciding which bits I didn't want. And he just couldn't cope with that. So, you know, luckily in the end, I found an editor that um, could do it. Uh, one of the installations that you had, which is eggs, and on the, thank you, on the wall, you had read, uh, written a reason as to how did this installation came into existence in your mind. You said that the installation is in the collection of some institution yes, at the moment. Yes, yeah, yeah. But uh, you also said that they just have the eggs yeah. minus that wall. To you as an artist, it is a perception of an idea that you had conceived in form of an installation, but this fragmented form of art of yours, how do you look at it as an artist now? Well, the text is very important. Yes, so the text is always the same, words, and so far, I've always gone and, and done it and written it in a very particular kind of writing. So, um, you know, that's going to be the issue. I mean, I guess they own, in a way, they own the text now. God forbid, as you said, when they're not around, and yeah. who's going to be doing the writing, because when we look at art, we look at art for posterity. Yeah. So in that scenario, what would be your take as an artist that your installation remains as a work of art instead of becoming a fragmented work of art? Do you mean as a permanent installation? Yes, as a permanent. Um, well, now that it belongs to that institution, I don't think that um, it's possible for them to have it permanently. So. Uh, because it just wouldn't last. And I know that when I recently installed it in Victoria, a day after the show opened, um, the curator called and said, or she emailed and said, children had come in and they like the eggs. And some of them are real eggs. So they've been blown. So the children had taken the eggs and they fell on the floor. And so it's a quite fragile piece, you know, and uh, so there are some real eggs. There are quail eggs, turkey eggs, hen eggs, but there's also a marble egg and a wax egg and a stone egg and, um, you know, diverse eggs. Uh, so I don't know, I guess it's out of my hands, but... Um, so you as an artist would not like to interview? I don't think I can, you know, it's not mine anymore really.
Um, I know that, for example, if um, somebody wanted me to show it here, I couldn't just go and get more eggs and make more eggs. Uh, it, those eggs would have to come from that institution. Um, well, I would like to congratulate you for such wonderful works that you have shown. Thank you. as one of the artists who's influenced you a lot. And one associates pain a lot with Frida Kahlo as well. And it's so painful to even watch. Uh, but I did see, or it's hidden, or something I missed. I didn't see in your work, or the work that you've shown, uh, painfulness in that way. So I wonder, what is it about your work it, that yeah. It, you and how, how do you think your work connects to when, when I first went to art school uh, in England in the mid-70s, I really wanted to learn how to paint. And um, so, you know, there were modules. And when it was time for me to do the painting module, I was very excited. And I got these very exotic vegetables in a still life. And one of them was a Savoy cabbage, you know, a very leafy cabbage. And I started in the middle leaf of the cabbage and finished that. And I went, and they just said no. They said, um, you're defying 2,000 years of Western tradition. You can't paint like that. You have to cover everything in sort of brown and block it out and do another layer and do another layer. And then they took away my cabbage and my eggplant and, and they gave me bits of wood. And then I was supposed to paint those and I couldn't. So that was why they threw me out of that. I had to go into sculpture. And they were constantly telling me that I could not make work that was personal. That was the 70s. And so um, when I first read about Frida Kahlo in the early 80s, um, I started, you know, I found out that she made a painting of her own birth in 1932. And so I was, you know, freed from, um, you know, in the, in the West at that point, they really liked you to make work that was very much about um, art history and not about the things that you felt. And uh, another thing that's happened is, you know, by telling me that I was defying 2,000 years of Western tradition, they were not thinking about maybe the kinds of work I've been exposed to that was more flat, more miniature-like, with, um, you know, a strange perspective, a very flattened perspective. But over the next two decades, any artist, art student who was a person from another country was then pushed towards making work that was about their, their identity. And so if they wanted to make abstract work that was, uh, you know, not personal, they were, you know, it went into a kind of funny circle. So that was the reason I liked uh, Frida because I just loved the fact that she made work about her own life and in all of her paintings were these aspects of that. Other questions? Did we get anything else? Okay. Okay, thank you very much for coming. I, I'm supposed to thank her formally, which I'm not really very good at, but uh, as uh, you've seen, this is a new venue. And we are very happy that we are doing it in association with the Canadian consulate here. When we met Scott, we were always thinking that what could we do together. So then Sarinder came in, and it was the most ideal kind of an artist we could have because she has Punjabi connections. And Canadian embassy probably has this consulate in Chandigarh because of the Punjabis immigrating to Canada a lot, if I'm correct. And then also she is... Uh, a new media artist because we in the academy uh, started this uh, tradition of introducing new media artists uh, about a year and a half ago when we had Subodh Gupta here, one of the most prominent names in this field in the country. Then we had this National Art Week of New Media in which Bharti K. Sudarshan Shetty, Tukrar Tagra and others came in. Then we also had Jitish Kalat, Atul Dodia. So Sarinder really fit in very well in that tradition. And also, when I met her for the first time, I did not really know what she does. But then I Googled, then I talked to a couple of friends, and none other than uh, Ranveer Kaleka. He talked to me about her. He said, it would be a very good idea 
that if you have Sarinda here, it will be another introduction of what she thinks of the, the art in Canada and how you know, Punjabis who are staying, living in Canada, who are born in India, have a deep connection with their past. How do they reflect upon this? And Sarinda's art, as you've seen, it's like I would recall when, like when film came into the cinema, I mean, came into existence, that was the ideal thing which could have amalgamation of all the media as possible in this world. Although it took probably more than 50 years or more for this to happen in art when we had this installation artists actually are not really you know, using the traditional mediums of painting, painting, or sculpting, or, you know, they could relate to the day-to-day -day events and the, the difference between art imitating life or life imitating art kind of, you know, submerged. And this is a very good example of, uh, uh, you know, how do you reflect upon your initial years when you're groomed as a child, what kind of influences you have, and how long they stay with you, and how do you kind of, you know, represent those through your art, which acquires a meaning, a much deeper meaning later on for others to ponder over, you know, what their lives have been, what their lives should be in future. I must thank Scott for providing this uh, unusual kind of avenue, which is usually used for, you know, people coming to this window for applying visas and stuff like that, opening this place for such an, um, event which is a wonderful event with an artist showing her work here and I'm so glad from the academy side also most of us are regular viewers and audience who have come in here for the, for the first time I'm sure we will look forward to many such collaborations and many more artists from Canada coming to Chandigarh through this embassy uh, consulate and in collaboration with us. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sarinda, for presenting such a wonderful presentation to the audience, to the people of Chandigarh. We, from the Academy, all our members, all the ex executive of the Academy, and the audience of Chandigarh, we are very grateful to you. Thank you very much.